Okay guys, here's your first introductory biology lecture. This is what we're going to talk about. With, uh, what we're going to talk about in it is nucleic acids. Nucleic acids come in two different flavors we want to remember. Deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid, which I'll now forever call DNA and RNA. We're going to talk about how they're shaped, how they're put together, and what their function is. Before we get to that, I want to talk about something called the central dogma of biology. And it has to do with the macromolecules DNA, RNA, and protein. DNA is housed in the nucleus. This is the source of all genetic information. This is where it's stored. If we want some function done in a cell, and we have a gene that encodes this function, here's the very, very scant outline of how that happens. The DNA that encodes the gene that makes the protein that will do that function will be transcribed into RNA. So here's our DNA. It's gonna, transcription is going to happen here. We're going to then get an RNA molecule that's carrying that same information the DNA molecule has. This is then going to go interact with something called a ribosome, and this is going to be translated and will encode a protein, and a protein does stuff, right? So we want to know DNA stores the information, it's transcribed into RNA, RNA is then translated into proteins, and proteins do stuff, okay? If you remember nothing else, remember the roles of DNA, RNA, and protein, and what order they come in this process of needing to do a function, and having that function be encoded by something. Okay, so nucleic acids is the catch-all term for both DNA and RNA. Nucleic acids are made of big long, are big long chains of something called nucleotides. This right here is a diagram of a nucleotide. A nucleotide has three pieces to it. A sugar molecule in the middle, a phosphate group up over here that's always going to be attached to carbon number five. That ultimately in biology is very, very important. We'll learn why later on and something called a nitrogenous base. Hold that thought for a minute, we'll get back to it soon. Each of these, in addition to being called formally nucleotides, you'll often hear them referred to as bases. The way that these come together and make a chain has to do with the following. You'll have one nucleotide here, its phosphate group will be over here. The phosphate group to another nucleotide will be attached to this first one at carbon number three. So, a single nucleotide has its phosphate group attached to carbon number 5. When they're making a chain, they're linked by carbon 3 and carbon 5. The fact that they always link to these two carbons is going to result practically in the fact that we always have our sugars down the middle, we always have our phosphates over here on the left side, and we always have this other mystery group we'll talk about in a second, the nitrogenous base, pointing over here on the, on the right side. So you're never going to have a nucleotide chain that has the base over here, and then the next one's got the base over here, and then, you know, the next one's got it over here. They don't form that shape that way. Okay, so nucleotides come in two different flavors, ribonucleotides and deoxyribonucleotides. And the difference between them has to do with this sugar molecule. Deoxyribonucleotides are made of a sugar called ribose, phosphate and nitrogenous base. Ribonucleotides are made of a sugar called ribose with phosphate and uh, nitrogenous base. The difference between them is right here on carbon number two. Deoxyribose has a hydrogen, ribose has a hydroxyl group. Hydroxyls are very, very reactive. Hydrogens are very, very inert. So if you are a ribonucleotide, you are a little more reactive than a deoxyribonucleotide. Okay, so remember that nitrogenous base we skipped over a second ago. We're going to get back to it now. But just before we get started, here's our sugar molecule. Here's our phosphate. This is attached to carbon 5. Here's the next one in the chain. Its phosphate's attached to carbon 3. 
uh, sorry, to carbon five, and it's hooked onto this first one by carbon three, okay? So here come the nitrogenous bases. They're pointed out in this direction, always on the same side. And what you can see here is that basically they come in two major shapes. They can be these big bulky double rings, or they can be these much smaller single rings. So the ones with the single rings are called pyrimidines. And there are three different pyrimidines we want to talk about. Cytosine, uracil, and thymine. The, bulk or, the bulkier, bigger ones with the double rings are called purines. And we only have two of those we need to worry about, guanine and adenine. Okay, so why are there three of these and two of these? And up here on this side, on this slide, we're seeing only four different things. And some of you may remember and know from whatever source that nucleic acids tend to be made up of linkages of four different bases. Yet we're talking about five. So the difference here has to do with this and this. So for nucleotides, adenine, guanine, and cytosine, these can be either ribonucleotides or deoxyribonucleotides. So this group, this group, and this group can attach to either ribose or deoxyribose. The, it, the um, corollary to that is that you can find adenine, guanine, or cytosine in DNA molecules or RNA molecules. The difference comes only in these two pyrimidines right here. Uracil can only attach to ribose, so you only see it in ribonucleotides and therefore you only see it in RNA. Thymine is the opposite. It only attaches to deoxyribose. You only see it in deoxyribonucleotides, and then you only find it in DNA molecules. So there's the point put in colored font for you. If you see a uracil in a bit of sequence, you know you're looking at a string of ribonucleotides and you know you're looking at an RNA molecule. If you see thymine in a sequence, you know you're looking at a DNA molecule. So if I put this bit of sequence up, hopefully everybody would be able to say what type of sequence this is. This is an RNA sequence. So think long and hard about why you should know that and how you'd know that, because that is something I'd expect you to know, okay? Okay, so what do nucleic acids do? They make up the first two thirds of this central dogma to biology. They encode the genes and they also work on transcribing them. When nucleic acids were first discovered, specifically DNA, it was called the secret of life. And here it was at the, on the cover of Life magazine, which is of course now Time magazine. Um, this is an image from the Smithsonian Institute talking about um, the genetic commonalities between humans and several other um, related and not so related organisms. What DNA ultimately is, and was first recognized as, was a heritable material that generated this and described relationships between organisms. The very first um, example of this in publication where somebody first recognized what DNA could do involved something called Griffith's experiment. So this guy was studying the bacterial organism Streptococcus pneumoniae. This is, as we'll learn later in the semester, this is a respiratory pathogen of humans. So what he observed was that he tended to find two different types of colonies of Strep pneumoniae. First were these ones that had kind of this gooey stuff on the surface. He called these smooth colonies, or S colonies. He also would then see these rough ones that didn't have this gooey stuff. They weren't as shiny, they were much drier. He called these rough colonies, or R colonies. And an important point was that he noticed these smooth ones caused disease in mice, and these rough ones, and humans for that matter, and these rough ones did not. What he found was that if he took these and he grew them in a lab and he kept passing the rough colonies, they never really lost that rough appearance. If he kept passing the smooth ones, on the other hand, they would lose their smooth appearance and become rough. So it seemed that the smooth colonies 
had something that they could lose. And the rough colonies didn't have something that made them rough. They just lacked something that made them smooth. So Griffith's experiment, a very famous experiment. It's a paper that was published in the 20s. Very interesting read if anybody's ever up for it. What he did was he took four groups of mice. And he infected them with different um, combinations of smooth and rough colonies. The first thing he did was a positive control. Just as a reminder... Um, a positive control is something where you're expecting the outcome to work at its utmost, at its maximum, to make sure that your experimental system is working. The positive control in this case was that he took mice and he injected them with smooth bacteria, fully expecting that the mice would get sick and die and that he would be able to recover smooth bacteria from them. That worked as expected. The negative control is completely the opposite, where you knowingly perform an experiment where you do not expect to see an effect to make sure that, that there's no uh, background problem that's going to create the illusion of an effect in your experiment. So in Griffith's case, he injected uh, rough bacteria into mice. The mice stayed perfectly healthy, and if he did get any bacteria back out, they were rough. So those are controls. Bear in mind, anytime we're talking about an experiment, we want to make sure that we're recognizing what the best possible control is. At this moment, Griffith didn't know one of two things. He didn't know if whatever it was that made smooth bacteria smooth could be transferred to something else, or he didn't know if the smooth material, the gooey stuff on the outside of the colonies, was actually somehow poisonous or toxic, and that's what actually killed the mice. So in one experimental group, the first thing he did was kill these bacteria so they weren't alive, but they still had the gooey stuff on them, and inject those into mice. When he did that, the mice didn't get sick, and there were no bacteria in them. So that kind of eliminated the toxic idea. The last thing he did was if there was some kind of element that was present in the smooth bacteria but not in the rough bacteria, he wanted to see could he transfer that to the rough bacteria. So what he did was he took these same killed smooth bacteria, he mixed them in with rough bacteria, so he takes two situations where he's getting healthy mice and he injected it in. And what he found was that he got sick mice. And when he extracted bacteria back out, he had smooth bacteria. So his conclusions were that his experiment was sound because his controls worked very nicely. The capsule material, the smooth, gooey stuff, was not somehow poisonous. It did not kill mice in and of itself. And that if he mixed the two, where you had capsule alone or rough colonies alone not killing mice, and if you mix them, you do get dead mice, what could be the possible explanation for that? And so he came up with and coined the phrase that there was some heritable material that the rough colonies, or the rough bacteria were picking up from the dead smooth bacteria. And of course we now know that that's exactly right, that these rough bacteria were picking up DNA from the smooth bacteria that were dead, and they were somehow incorporating it. They were then expressing it. They were, they were trans having it be transcribed into RNA. That RNA was then being translated, making proteins that ultimately result in this smooth material that kills the mice, that when it's uh, in association with a live bacterial cell, kills the mice. So DNA structure, now to get back to this, is um, it particularly important and has a lot to do with the fact that it's a very stable molecule. DNA structure is anti-parallel, meaning that there are two strands, two separate chains of uh, nucleic acid, sorry, two separate chains of um, deoxyribonucleotides. They face each other and one of them is upside down and backwards relative to the other. That's what anti-parallel means. These don't just stay in a straight line. 
they actually interact um, on a secondary structural level and twist into this double helix structure that everybody hopefully is familiar with. The sugar phosphate backbone, so the um, so think of each one of these as that um, sugar pentagon and this phosphate group being up here and the next phosphate linked back to this. This is always on the outside. The nitrogenous base group always is on the inside. And then the second strand is exactly the same way. The phosphate group is, uh, the sugar phosphate backbone is on the outside and the nitrogenous base is facing the inside. What happens at this point, what holds these strands together is that the two nitrogenous base groups interact with each other and form something called base pairs. The way that this works is that each functional base pair always has to have one purine and one pyrimidine or one big bulky double ring and one small single ring. The pairings as they exist are always A pairing with T and G pairing with C. If we have an instance where somehow we have an A pairing with a G, what's going to happen is that this is going to bulge out like that and it's not going to work. We have DNA uh, and a whole suite of enzymes called DNA repair enzymes that are going to come say that's not right, cut it out and fix it. So why do we have to have purine and pyrimidine pairing? If you have two purines base pairing with each other, these are going to be too big and too bulky to make this a nice straight line that can then properly twist into a double helix. As I was saying a second ago, this is going to bulge out and it's not going to be able to form the proper shape of a DNA helix. On the other hand, why can't you have a pyrimidine pyrimidine pairing? These two, while they're not going to be so big as to pucker the molecule out, they're too far apart to actually interact with each other. So DNA molecules, the two strands, are held together by hydrogen bonding. These two are not close enough together to create hydrogen bonds with one another that are going to hold these strands together. It's only when you have one purine and one pyrimidine that you have a pairing that's going to fit within these constraints and be close enough to form hydrogen bonds. So just to get back to those hydrogen bonds for a moment, um, what is known about DNA base pairing is that cytosine guanine pairs are stronger and more stable than adenine thymine pairs. It was thought for a long time that this had to do with hydrogen bonding. There are three spots on these pairings that are able to hydrogen bond and there are only two here. Recent evidence suggests that this, this story is actually quite a bit more complicated than that, um, but I'll leave that to um, MolBio and Biochem to, to describe. This link right here, um, hopefully on our class Blackboard page, you'll be able to find this PowerPoint file. You'll be able to link to this. This actually is a short animation showing you how these um, base pairings work and how these double helix molecules are actually put together. So if you'd like, and this is not still not speaking to you, please go watch this video. It hopefully will help as you see it form in real time. Just a few quick words about DNA and evolution. DNA as a molecule is highly structured and it's extremely stable. You can leave a tube of DNA on a lab bench top for months, come back and still find some functional DNA in it. For biological evolution, that's good. If you have a beneficial mutation, a beneficial change, you want to make sure that you're recording that change in some molecule that's going to be able to keep it stably. For chemical evolution, that's not that great. If we're talking about um, biological macromolecules that are starting to take on the um, properties of actual living things, DNA is not a particularly good one to do that. It's not catalytic, it's not stable, it, sorry, <laughs> it is stable but that's not particularly good because it would just hang around forever. It can't really do anything in and of itself. It would just sit there. On the other hand, 
We're now going to talk about RNA, which is not terribly stable and extremely catalytic, extremely biologically active. One of the big differences between DNA and RNA has to do with their shape, and this is alluded to in this first slide. RNA comes in many different forms, it does many different functions, and you can find it assembling itself into many different shapes. First, in terms of similarities between these two molecules, they're both made of nucleotides. They both have this sugar phosphate backbone, and they both have their nitrogenous bases oriented on the same side. That's about where we stop. The differences between these two, some of them we've discussed already and some of them we are about to learn. The first is that obviously they're made of, uh, RNA is made of ribonucleotides as opposed to deoxyribonucleotides. Ribonucleotides have ribose as opposed to deoxyribose. And as we've mentioned again, RNA molecules have uracil in them, DNA molecules have thymine in them. One of the big differences we have not yet mentioned is that as opposed to being a double-stranded molecule, in the vast majority of instances, RNA is a single-stranded molecule, meaning there's no second backbone here and there's no base pairing as a general rule that goes on. There are some exceptions to that we'll get to in a second. Another huge difference is the biological role of RNA. RNA is extremely functional. It's involved in a lot of different things. So RNA structure. Remember this one oxygen that was different between ribose and deoxyribose. This is inert. This is extremely reactive. That said, ribonucleotides much more reactive than deoxyribonucleotides. In addition to that, we have this single strand with all of these ribonucleotides now just facing out to interact with lots of different things, including the other bases that are in this same strand. So a single str piece of RNA can actually bend up onto itself and have a little bit of base pairing here and create these extremely large complex shapes. The same RNA molecule under slightly different circumstances can let go of this base pairing, form a completely different shape. It can then interact with some proteins under a, or another RNA molecule under yet a third set of circumstances and take on another shape. This link right here is to an animation of a, a single RNA molecule. It's a, um, again, it's a computer animation, not an actual video of a single RNA molecule that under different circumstances is going to wildly change its shape. A key point about biological macromolecules in general is that their shape in many ways dictates their function. If an RNA molecule changes its shape, very often it's going to change its stability and change its function. The biological role of RNA is a little difficult to grab onto, and that's because there are several different roles for several different types and forms of RNA. We'll talk about those a bit later in another video clip. The way, or a good way to think about DNA, RNA, and protein is to think about them in terms of different types of bees. So if we put this in extremely simple terms, DNA is very inert, it's very lazy, it doesn't do anything for itself. Important? Extremely. But it doesn't really do anything without RNA and protein to help it. Proteins, as we said before, do stuff. They're busy. They're mindless. They are extremely functional. They're critically important. But they don't really encode anything. They don't store any information. RNA interfaces between these two molecules. So if we go back and say, what does it have to do with bees? Think about it this way. DNA is like a queen bee. Extremely important to the hive, but she doesn't really do anything for herself. 
she really can't survive without the worker bees being there to massage her and feed her and get her ready to make new baby bees or whatever it is that queen bees do. I'm not big on, I'm not big with insects, I don't really know. But the point is, this seems to make sense to me, to think of DNA as a queen bee and to think of proteins as worker bees. RNA, in my little analogy, is best thought of as a drone bee. Let's get down here for a second. Drone bees interface between the queens and the workers. So drone bees are male bees. They're the, the fathers of all the, or one of them anyway, is the father of all the workers. Drone bees really don't do very, or uh, drone bees are don't have a giant long-lived role in the hive. They're very, very active for an extremely short period of time, and then they die off. So they're very critical, they're very active, but they're very unstable. They don't hang around that long. RNA facilitates cellular activities, and it does this in two different ways. It does this by delivering the messages that are encoded in DNA, and it also, a different type of RNA, helps to actually assemble the proteins. So it's involved with both of these guys. Critical, but very unstable. Doesn't hang around that long. The last point uh, is about RNA and the origin of life. So if we start thinking back to chemical evolution and the idea that the first uh, macromolecule that mimicked a life form well that it would have had to have some ability to store information and it would have had to be very catalytically active. DNA, as we said a few minutes ago, stores information extremely well, but it's very inert. Proteins are very, very catalytically active, but they don't store any information. RNA can do both. And in particular, a type of RNA called a ribozyme, which is a contraction of RNA enzyme, these are molecules learn about them more later in the semester, that can actually add ribonucleotides to other RNA molecules. So in other words, they're catalytically active. We've got a little video clip about some ribozyme research that's um, fairly interesting if you're, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, so this, led, these type, this discovery of ribozymes and this type of research led to the, something called the RNA world hypothesis, meaning that all living things on Earth now are more or less descended from an original form of life that was likely to be RNA based. And this is because it has properties of both DNA and protein that make them ideally suited to be the first form of life, but it lacks the things about them that were not ideally suited to be the first form of life. Namely, it stores information and it can replicate itself. So that being said, it's widely believed the first forms of life were exclusively made of RNA or, or used RNA. That being said, the next clip we're going to listen to is about um, proteins and protein biochemistry.